Hello, people of the internet. This is Kaiju Noir, and this is a review for the 2007 uh, sort of indie comedy kaiju parody movie called Dai Nippon Jin, or better known in America as Big Man Japan. This was a video that this was uh, what that was actually uh, recommended by my co-host here, Matt Denian, who you may know as the writer behind several kaiju thrillers such as Atomic Rex, Polar Yeti, um, Operation Rock, Chimera, Scourge of the Gods, his first book. I, he has been here on the channel several times, as a matter of fact. And so during our recording of the re most recent episode of the Shoe Watch podcast, uh, Matt actually recommended that we do a review for this particular film after it was mentioned in a previous conversation. So give it up for my guest here once again from the Colossal Review and the Kong Skull Island Review. Give it up for Matt Denian. Thank you, Andres. It's always a pleasure to come on your show and uh, been super excited to do the Big Man Japan review. We've talked about it a couple times, so I'm glad we're finally able to sit down and get this thing done. Absolutely, man. Uh, it's always a pleasure to collaborate on with you on these sorts of reviews. Now, uh, what was it that brought Big Man Japan into one of our conversations? Oh, uh, I think it originally started uh, <laughs> not one uh, for the review that or the uh, interview that hasn't aired yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, to say because. Um, <laughs> Uh, big man. So uh, Andres has a review on with me coming out, talking to me more specifically about my books. But I think mm. it came up with when I had said that the um, Yokozuna character in um, Atomic Rex was influenced by my love of uh, professional wrestling and of Big Man Japan. So I think when we were talking about that, all right, from the, said, the Yokozuna was the like the big fat monster that was in Atomic Rex. Yes, and he was uh, like a human that was mutated uh, to be a giant. And, right, uh, right. And I mentioned the possibility. I asked you if it was uh, in any way inspired by his, like the Colossal Man or the, the yes. Cyclops. Um, yes. And then you mentioned Big Man Japan. I was like, oh, okay, okay. B big, awkward looking sumo wrestler dude. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, from there, we talked about uh, eventually doing the uh, review that we're going to do right now. So. All right, excellent. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's how you've been <laughs> caught up to speed so far. So, what was your first. Uh, what was your first exposure to this 2007 uh, Japanese film? Um, I think it was first uh, just seeing a trailer, which really interested me. Probably on uh, maybe one of my old Godzilla Blu-rays that had, uh, popped up or, or just on the internet or probably on YouTube. And um, anyway, I was fortunate enough to finally download the film about a year ago mm -hmm. and uh, watch it. And it was uh, it turned out to be much different than I expected from the trailer because uh for anybody who's seen a trailer it comes off as uh a very more ser a very serious movie like 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 a straight action monster movie monster mash i i think more of like a like a, i almost thought it was more of a comedy mm, okay. monster mash um but there's a lot more to the film than uh -huh. just the the comedic because the monsters are kind of portrayed very comedically but mm. um there's much more to the film than just this kind of uh spoof of the kaiju genre like it's there but mm -hmm. there's a, a really good story mixed into it as well yeah so. yeah absolutely um it's almost like you had the exact opposite um experience i had you i had when i saw the death kappa trailer many years ago <laughs> thinking that yeah. oh this is going to be a cool neat goofy mon uh, kaiju parody similar to gehara and what it right. turns out to it turns out there's a whole other different side of to the movie that's wasn't interesting in the least to me personally whatsoever uh so yeah i guess for my exposure first exposure to big man japan it was actually from uh matt frank actually where back in the day before matt frank was uh popular for being the uh one of the most po uh, uh most popular artists for the idw godzilla comics i think you know he was mostly known for his deviant art work on godzilla neo he had a, yes. a blog called the roaring brain i think it was called and so on his blog, he would bring up certain topics such as Transformers, uh, Godzilla, back when it was rumored that Legendary was, and Warner Brothers was going to do something with the character. And he made a, a post about giving his thoughts on Big Man Japan, stating that the movie was weird and very Japanese. 
And so that okay. caught my caught my interest, saying, "Okay, this looks like something very different." And so I eventually saw the movie a while back. I actually I didn't see the movie in full. I saw clips on YouTube of all the highlights of the fights. And what I saw was like, "Okay, this is strange. This is weird." Um, I don't know if I like this or not, but then as the years went by and, you know, me eventually being like a YouTuber and more analytically focused on when in in my viewing experiences, movie watching experiences, I finally watched the movie in full for the first time for this review, actually, and I grew to appreciate it knowing the full context around those bizarrely staged, um, fights in, featured in the, in the movie, and so uh, I guess that should get that um, pretty much covers our backgrounds with the movie. And yeah. so uh, let's get right into the uh, brief uh, plot synopsis for the story. So basically what happens is this is like a very um, kind of like an alternate reality take on the typical giant hero um, setup like Ultraman yes. or Spectre Man or Zone Fighter any sort of giant hero story where you have uh, this is a world where that's populated by monsters and there's a defender to protect Japan against these monsters and so we have a character by the name of uh, Masaru, uh, Masaru Daisato and Daisato he is the latest in a long line of uh, Dai Nipponjin or in the, for in the case of you know for the subtitles Big Man Japan uh, I'm not sure which one, which name you would prefer to call him. His which superhero name you prefer to call him, Matt? Um, in the subtitled English version, they usually call him just Sato. Okay. I don't know if that, uh, as far as like the character, and then the news reports are called Big Man Japan. So right. Um, I guess Sato is easiest, maybe. maybe right. That or... Yeah, uh, Dai Sato. Yeah. Okay. We yeah, it would be easier. So yeah, in in his family line, there are a uh, group. There are. Um, he had come from a line of superhumans where when they are zapped in the nipples um, with electricity, <laughs> they become giant sumo wrestler warriors to protect Japan against uh, against monsters. And he is the, I think that he is the sixth generation of, of the um, big man Japan yes. people. Um, his father passed away in the events before this movie, and his you see his grandfather who plays a big role in his life as yes. the as the form as the uh, known as the fourth. Yes. Um, and it's hinted at there, there that there are other heroes in this world, but he is the last one. Um, in the story, and so he kind of this is, movie takes has uh, takes the form of a mockumentary where it's made to look like uh, people are interviewing him and recording him. So you see, it's very much so like a character study more than anything else of yes. Daisato and his normal day-to-day life and how much he really gets screwed over and how much he longs for the days that his grandfather had because his grandfather was well-respected. Meanwhile, he gets zero respect whatsoever and kind of gets screwed at every end as we learn more and more about his life and his upbringing. And eventually, this culminates in a battle between him and the, one of the more powerful uh, monsters that you see early on, uh, about maybe midway through the movie. And so, uh, that's basically the gist of the story for Big Man Japan. And I do want to bring up that this movie was written, directed, and starring um, Hitoshi Matsumoto. And Hitoshi Matsumoto, he is a, from what I've learned... Uh, Upon my viewing with one of my friends here in Japan, he is one of the most popular comedians in Japan, and he's best known as being part of a uh, comedic duo known as Downtown, alongside another comedian by the name of uh, Masatoshi Hamada. And both Masatoshi Hamada and Hitoshi Matsumoto, they um, produced a TV, a variety, a, com- a comedy variety show on television where it's kind of like half SNL, half jackass, uh, with some fun comedic uh, interviews along the way, uh, in between, where basically they play games, and if they lose the game, they have to partake in a very humiliating um, stunt that usually involves physical pain or like food, like pie to the face, sort of a lot of um, like either kick in the nuts, pie in the face type of physical comedy. And uh, I, the, when I watched this movie, I watched it with a friend uh, who was a big fan of Hitoshi Matsumoto and was really surprised to see him in a, not only in a movie, but to see him in kind of like a very down-to-earth type of um, role. 
but it still fe- it still has that very comedic wit where a lot of the comedy it's 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 very different from other Japanese comedies I would say where a lot of comedies Japanese comedies tend to be very over the top here everything really? the comedy comes from how subdued everything subdued everything is me in a very it's like it's a very mundane world it's a very they have mundane characters in an over the top world I would say yeah yeah I I didn't know that other background he's put out but that kind of makes mm-hmm. the movie even more interesting like you said because mm-hmm. of the fact that the humor is very very subtle and it's not very like um in your face you know, laugh tracking in your face yeah yes. yeah 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 um, uh it's it's like you, you don't have really care you don't have characters that are not super over the top and they're acting like anime characters which i've never been a fan of when it comes to japanese modern japanese acting right uh here it's like the comedy comes from how normal everybody how nonchalant everybody acts when giant monsters are afoot like there's this one scene early on where um they talk about how daisato he is just walk he goes to the same uh restaurant every day every every week and orders the same meal and the interviewer asks the cook is like do you are you aware that daisato is big man japan he's like huh I didn't know that. I guess you can't tell a book from uh, you can't judge a book by its cover nowadays. And it's um, even things like in the movie they uh, broadcast the battles for ratings, and yeah. uh, you know they, they make a point of pointing out like, oh, you're on at two in the morning, so and, and you only get people... like the the ratings are like one percent, and then oh, you you lost a battle, the ratings went up. It's it was now like five percent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that does put it at even more of an interesting spin on the on the movie that that's the uh, the case. Yeah, so. where like monsters are kind of like are such an everyday occurrence in this society that people are very uh, more uh, are not so much bothered by it, but rather they're more bothered by Big Man Japan's actions. Um, they are often complaining about the destruction he causes, and they put so much of the blame on him and him alone. Um, in fact, there was another bit of like dark. There's also bits of dark comedy where, um, in the scene leading up to his very first transformation, he drives up on the motorcycle with the the film, the documentary crew driving behind him. And as they're driving up the hill towards the power plant where he transforms, there are a lot of signs posted everywhere by protesters. Um, and the, as they're driving along. Uh, thankfully the subtitles you know translate mo- most yes. of the, mo- the more important signs the insults get more and more um cruel uh yeah. to to a very, very ludic- ludicrous part where it's one person's like um uh, big man J- japan sucks um this guy destroyed my car kill yourself <laughs> yeah it's... yeah and it get again it's like more and more uh, uh surreal and absurd at how the at how this movie tries to break the conventions of what you would expect when from something that as opposed to like Ultraman where everything's more like uh, very innocent very um, clear cut good guy bad guy here it's like a much more uh, down to earth and cruel uh, mean spirited type of story yes and I think a key um, juxtaposition I don't know if this word up. Uh, a counter to that would be that they reminisce about his grandfather, who you mentioned as the fourth. And mm-hmm. uh, like you said, they, his grandfather, when he was big man Japan, was very respected. You see clips of like parades mm-hmm. where, um, you know, they're honoring him. And uh, Daisatu makes uh, comments like they ask him how much he makes. And he only makes like uh, $5,000 a, a month. Right, and only two thousand comes from his actual work as big man in Japan. Right, right. right. I, I will say, uh, two thousand is a livable salary in Japan. Okay. Um, but it's considered like a very, it's like the lowest, um, livable salary. Like you can you can live comfortably in Japan with two thousand dollars, but it's like the lowest of the low, and in terms of living the, on your own. The service that you, he's providing for the country, you'd think that he would be worth more. Right, and, right. Uh, he, he makes even comments like that his grandfather never had to pay for food or anything because people would just buy it for his grandfather yeah. out of respect and uh, out of admiration for the job that he's doing. Uh-huh. So um, I think that the movie, and you could probably speak to this more than I can living uh-huh. in Japan, but um, that the movie kind of shows a cultural shift away from the values of the previous generation to yeah. the newest generation. Uh-huh. Um, 
in, in like a very well done and tasteful manner too. It wasn't like disrespectful to either generation. It just right, kind of a right. commentary on this is just the way things were and this is the way things are now. Yeah, yeah. I do get a feeling that there are hints of criticism at both sides, both the yes. older generation and the newer generation. They do criticize the newer generation for not being as culturally aware of their history. A, most, a lot of a modern day Japanese people, they don't really care about their history. They just focus on the here and now. They focus on like what is popular now. They focus on the latest and greatest. Um, not too different, I would say, from our culture in America. Yeah. Um, but we do have a lot of uh, reverence for the people that came before, um, especially in education. It's like, you know, these are the people that helped shape our country. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you, 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 it would be impossible to come across someone who didn't know who... Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, or who Abraham right. Lincoln was, who George right. Washington was. In Japan, you know, like whoever is the equivalent of those historical figures in Japanese history, they could gi give less of a damn about. Okay. And so it makes sense for these people to, you know, completely forget the importance that the previous, you know, generations of big men, big men Japan were. Um, and at the same time, it's you look. They the the way they criticize the older generation is their struggle. Their struggle to adapt to the new generation. Um, certain thing, there are certain traditions that are carried on, even though they're kind of completely unnecessary. But they do do these things out of the sake of tradition, like the uh, ritual that they perform before Big Man um, before Daisato becomes Big Man Japan, where right. it's a, this very like old school Shinto. Um, uh, ceremony and ritual, and even comment on how like they used there used to be like fifty people involved in these rituals. Now it's just like one dude and two guys, and even the two guys they are technically the they have to observe it, but they don't really do so anyways. And they're they're doing it in like a warehouse that's right down. It's not like it's a, a temple. And um, at one point, they even asked the uh, the priest, I guess, to redo the ceremony because they didn't film it correctly so it's right. kind of like oh okay i was start there's, back from here yeah, yeah there's there's no there's no um there's clearly not that much respect for or like not well what, what would you say um it doesn't reverence, fe reverence. Yeah, yeah exactly there's yeah. not a lot of rever reverence for this ceremony that takes place and um meanwhile i feel like you have uh daisato who's kind of like a, a victim of this lineage that was like thrusted upon him and especially when it came to when it came to his father the fate of his father it really i feel like i really got a sense of this was like a pure like a sh this was like a really big shot against uh japanese culture where um wh what happened to Dais daisato's father who was I? We can assume is was the fifth big man Japan. He right. was very jealous of the newer heroes that were coming onto the scene and kind of stealing the spotlight away from him. We don't see who these heroes are, but we can assume no. that these are other parodies of you know, or you know, more sen as we learn at the end of the movie that there are you know other characters that are clear parodies of other um, pop Japanese pop culture characters but for yes. him he was very he had this kind of like a inferiority complex he wanted to get bigger and stronger than the rest of the people he wanted to look uh, he wanted to look over uh, look down on people both figuratively and literally yes and yeah. so he ended up zapping himself with so much electricity that he ended up killing himself causing the fourth his father the daisato's grandfather to come out of retirement and go and protect japan far longer than he should have to the point where he's almost like he is pretty much senile due to the amount of electricity he had to endure more so than any other generation yes and he also uh kind of became uh daisato's guardian it would seem right right um, after his his father had uh, died as a result of trying to um, to get bigger. And what becomes from the movie, I feel like, is a very interesting character study in Daisato, who's sort mm -hmm. of this man out of time, almost, if you will. Where, right. Like you said, because of his lineage and his role, he's um, you know still trying to live up to this um, idea of what big man Japan should be. Even, whereas, though, even though it doesn't really work in today's modern con exactly. modern society, right. and his and his um, the government certainly doesn't do a, a good job at helping him adjust to this to this new society. Um, 
Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I say no. Uh, you know, he's he's paid a minimum wage and he doesn't seem to get much support at all. And as the movie mm-hmm. progresses, the government takes a different approach to him. And mm-hmm. uh, because of it, because of like he's kind of misplaced, um, he doesn't seem to have a whole lot of friends personally. Like you never mm-hmm. see him talk to anybody. Like you said, even the place where he goes every day to know who he was. Mm-hmm. Um, he's was married with a, uh, a woman. child. Yeah. Oh, with a child. And, yeah. 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 And uh, his they're that, now divorced and yeah, his daughter's yeah. picked on because he's big man in Japan, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which also brought the issues and Abigail into it, too, because they touched on it very briefly. But that his daughter, I guess, should be the next in line. They comment that a, a, a female can take up that role as mm. a big woman in Japan, I suppose. But yeah. that the, the mother is completely against it, not only just seemingly for the... Uh, the safety of her, yeah, and the safety right, of safety, her daughter, but also because of the stigma that being big man in Japan seems to have at this point. Did you, did you take that as well? Like, yeah, yeah, I, I got that. But also, she didn't want her to fill that role, you know. Right, right. It's kind of like a now. It's sort. It's he's also very depressed that you know he could be the very last one. You know, it's like yes. he took very. In, he, you see, he has a lot of love for his daughter. He takes a lot of pride in his daughter and his, 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 you know, his own flesh and blood and. Yes to be you know you can see he the the disappointment he had when uh, learning that his mother uh when his wife was ashamed of of daisato's lin of you know um responsibility she doesn't want the the daughter to be her voice and her face to be shown on camera right. uh so it's like there's that sort of level of detachment that the wife makes between him and his daughter and the daughter herself she doesn't really seem to care all that much about the about her father's responsibility um so it's like he's very isolated from the world and especially from his own family and it's very ironic that the one like one of the perhaps the only uh legit relationship he has with anyone are the women at that particular bar he goes to where you pay women to you you literally pay women to drink with you um, so it's like a very artificial relationship, but it's with one of the women there who was like, I think she was like 53 years old, um, yeah. in the movie, she has a genuine concern for, for Daisato. So it's like the one woman who you would ha- expect to have the most artificial relationship with is sadly the closest thing he has to a real relationship with, with someone, be it romantic or platonic. Yeah. And, uh... She doesn't even live in the same city as him. I took that as right because as he yeah. traveled to a different city to see her, so he right, is right. like very much detached. In fact, he even there's like a stray cat he kind of takes care of. That yeah, seems like his only kind of a uh, uh, companion with anything. Companion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's that's a good way to put it. Um Because yeah, yeah. like the filmmaker comments, "Is that your cat?" He says, "No, it's not. It just kind of comes around when it's hungry, but you know, I yeah. take care of it and stuff." Um, yeah. And then uh, meanwhile, with mm-hmm. the backdrop of all this is is monsters attacking and him having to go deal with that as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I do want to go back onto the father thing because I want to make the parallels between what's currently happening in Japan right now and what happened okay. to his father. And that is uh, a lot of Japanese society revolves around uh, the salary man job. You know, the the stereotypical Japanese businessman is a big part of Japanese culture, where you know you go to school so you can get a um, or you go to school so you can study hard and go to a big co- uh, to a big college and then you study really hard in college so you can join uh, join a big company a well respected company and so for a lot of Japanese men in today's society in Japanese society they dedicate so much of their lives to their work that their family lives end up suffering as a result you know they're being completely detached from their families. And to the point where they put so much of their of their time and energy on work, a lot of them overwork themselves to death. I mean, there are people who stress so much over their lives, over their lives as, you know, salarymen, they end up suffering from heart attacks at such young, early ages due to being due. They are literally overworking themselves to death in Japan because of how much time and energy they put into their soul, solely dedicate themselves to their jobs. And in a way, we kind of see that with um, with Daisato's father, who, you know, he wanted to push himself. He wanted to be the very top. He wanted to, you know, prove he was the best at this job. And he ended up killing himself as a result. 
And we kind of see that with Daisato, where, you know, he put so much, dedicates so much of his life to this job that his family life ended up deteriorating. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, too, is it um, a commentary on uh, Japanese culture as well, perhaps, where um, Daisato's father pushes him far too early? Oh, yes, yes. Preparing Abs- him to be big man in Japan? Absolutely. I mean, in Japan, they you start kindergarten like two years earlier than americans do and okay. for uh, in america we have kindergarten for one year they have kindergarten for three years wow before they okay. start elementary school junior high school high school college i mean you know as a little kid you know these kids they could give less of a damn about education you know they want to have fun they want to play right. but already they're forced into that and on top of that <laughs> there's cram school um i don't know if cram school is a big thing in america where it's kind of like an after school study like session sort of deal where it's like after school you go to cram school to do further studies out after you're done studying it in 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 elementary school or middle school or high school they have some programs like that here but it's not it's not very big right you know? in like, in japan it's a really big thing because you know you got <laughs> all in you know even i think it's around middle school where it's where it's less about playing, it's about study, 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 so you can get into a good high school. And then when you go to high school, study, 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 so you can go to a work um, to get a good job that you'll most likely resent for the rest of your life. And to give the, the audience context for the film, there's a scene uh, mm-hmm. where uh, Sato's there's a Sato's essay about his uh, childhood, and yeah. he says, "Oh, I was I was plump, I was overweight," and um, they do kind of like a flashback, and they show uh, like a very chunky Japanese kid. Mm-hmm. Um, really being drugged by his father into a barn mm-hmm. and um the dad hooks up the uh the electricity uh power cables nipples, yeah power cables and um tries to make him grow at with um at a the very, that was at much far, too soon right or to much too early around. yeah yeah and it results in a funny scene where um only I thought there was chest grows yeah uh, as opposed to the rest of them but mm-hmm. it's also kind of like sad at the same time to see this poor kid being uh, you know, mm-hmm. pushed by his dad to not only be successful, but fill the role that his dad and his grandfather and all, like you said, there's years of lineage on top of mm-hmm. it at such a young age mm-hmm. um, to fill this role. And there could be another commentary with the grandfather, where the grandfather, he comes out of retirement and works far longer than he should uh, as big man Japan, as the fourth. And mm-hmm. that's another problem in Japan right now. I think I probably mentioned it in another video or, or two here and there on the, on the Kaiju Noir channel, where um, less and less people are having kids, which is causing a huge imbalance, meaning that later on in, in, in as the years go on, there will be more elderly people and less younger people to support the elderly people, meaning the elderly people, they can't easily retire. They have to continue working um, because... How else are they going to be able to support right. themselves with no with a dwindling population that uh, will provide less resources for the elderly people to continue living off of? I mean, the reason why we we have this both America and Japan <clears throat> have a sort of like a Medicare Medicaid system where you know the the money that the a lot of the tax money that the younger generation makes goes towards supporting a lot of that goes right. towards supporting the older generation but with no younger generation to support the older generation the whole t- entire system collapsed so maybe right. there was a little bit of commentary there with the with the fourth having to come out of retirement and kind of working himself until he eventually loses his mind and it's uh it's one thing i think came across well in this movie is any commentary is Subtle and done well within the context of the story. Yeah, yeah. And this is a very fascinating story, I would say. Um, yeah. You know, despite the ludicrous premise, it's a. I was very drawn in, and I love the mockumentary, uh, dr- uh, the direction to make this movie look and feel like a mockumentary. We're learning more about this world, yes. more about Daisato, and more about the life around him. It's such a fascinating world um, that this movie takes place in that... Um, I wouldn't mind seeing. I would. I mean, I think that this was like the best decision to make it into a mockumentary, and I wouldn't mind seeing more of this world, really. But I understand this is a one and done project, and I feel like as a one and done movie, this. I feel like we got a lot out of this, out of this character, and out of this world, and out of his, uh, his, this cast of char- these cast of characters. Yes. Yeah, I would say so. Um, 
I mean, just to give you an idea of how drawn in you get, uh, we've been doing this for how long? We haven't really even covered like any of the monsters or stuff. Yet. Right, right. We're talking about <laughs> mostly and that's like our thing. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty much so. And uh, the monster stuff, I do want to say. Uh, or is there anything else you want to say about the characters in the story? Uh, let's see. Um, again, I think it's just I, I really am interested, and I think you, you probably know the people too. Is, is by the fact that um, Santos like this character was very hard to define him. Where uh-huh. you know at some points you feel really bad for him. At some uh-huh. points you think he's kind of like a schlub, you know, where he's just not getting it. Uh-huh. Um, but. I feel like it's it's a very good character study of somebody who's trying their best and is just woefully inadequate yeah. at the position they found themselves thrust into. Right, which I guess is also another commentary on Japanese people who are kind of thrusted into their into these lie into their newfound jobs. And from what I understand with these jobs is that when you enter a Japanese salaryman business, they do very little to help you settle get settled into your job. It's like here you go, here's your assignment, get busy right now. Okay, because that that does come across with. His position is big man Japan as well. Right. So, no special treatment. No easing into this. It's like, you're the next dude. Go ahead. You, uh, everything, okay. every, all, any mistakes you make is totally on you. Okay. Because uh, they touched on it very kind of, not directly, but there didn't seem to be any kind of like mentoring program. Between no. His grandfather took all, over yeah. and then he's big man Japan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So is that, is that a, and again, I'm going to turn to you a lot for this. Is that like a Japanese culture thing where... Like, mm. uh, working as a teacher here in the U.S., like, we have the mentoring program you have to go through when uh-huh. you first become a teacher. So do they have similar setup there for I'm pretty sh- like that? I'm pretty sure, like, any sort of mentoring solely takes place during your education. Okay. And so once you do the job, like, the mentoring is over. It's like, you know, the tutorial's over now. It's Now it's like, uh, now you got to get to work. Okay, you got, then, you got you got to fill your role in society. You got to fulfill your role in society. Um, okay, yeah, that sort of deal. Uh, just because I came across in the film where it didn't feel like Sato was given anybody to kind of help guide him when he became big man Japan, right? Just, like you said, here you go, go do this, and yeah, he's woefully unprepared for it, which leads to the downfall of his personal life as well as his professional career. Right, right, so. and he's you know, he's a very bitter per- individual. Um, yeah. He kind of he, he kind of takes life um, takes life one day at a time, but at the same time, it's like he's always reminiscing about the past. He's very bitter at the fact that he was dealt this really um, uh, really bad hand. Uh, what what was the phrase? He has a bad he drew drew a bad hand, or he was given a bad draw in life. Uh, go ahead. But he seems to be very reactionary instead of proactive about very much so yeah 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 dealing and, with his issues like he, he doesn't take any a whole hmm. lot of initiative to build a better relationship with his daughter right right uh, that, yeah instance. as much as we feel sympathy for him he is also a very flawed character character where he does nothing to improve his life he just kind of wallows in self-pity yes exactly. and um he also kind of comes off as a bit of a, a, a man child or like a baby where it's like if things do not go his way, he kind of re- reacts even with more hostility. Whereas like the people, the, his agent, he has an agent in this movie that tries to get um, advertisement business deals, which is just very demeaning for him to yeah. go into battle with a giant poster plastered on his chest or his back. And, you know that they said like oh they want to do we couldn't get the right camera angle uh from the battle so we're gonna have to put the advertisement on your thighs and it's like no i like he's very sensitive about his thighs yeah. um and you know he he's very compl- he complains a lot about that stuff it's he he wants to ha- like it's like he what little control he has over his life he defends it vigorously in this case you know advertisement on the thighs <laughs> Yeah, or, <clears throat> or like the, his Sorry. daughter, or you know, not being able to feature his daughter um, without censorship within the documentary. Um, any sort, any time he loses what little control he has over his life, he reacts um, in a very petty sort of way. Now, my only other question uh, or observation and question for you, because uh, again, mm-hmm. I'm not as uh, immersed in Japanese culture as you are, mm-hmm. is that when he does perform his job as big man in Japan, uh-huh. he doesn't seem uh, 
they, they talk about how he, he crushed all these people's cars or whatever, but it doesn't mm. they don't really show that in right. in the movie. Like when he's actually funny other monsters, he actually seems to take extra care to be aware of his surroundings and not yeah. trash the city. Mm-hmm. Like when I first were talking about him and how he does things, I was kind of thinking of like this uh incredible Hulk type hero where maybe he uh-huh. stops the monster but you know he wrecks uh the entire yeah. city in the process. But it's not really the case. But right. it's not more of a I- commentary on his position in mm-hmm. in the culture or Maybe it's more of a position and more of a commentary on the uh, Japanese people in general, where they're because they're they complain about the littlest things, like a lot of like non issues. They make a big deal of like Japan is like a, focuses a lot on making a mount making mountains out of mole hills. Okay, and so like every they're very Japanese people I've noticed are like very picky and they will complain about the littlest, least important things. Um, and you know they're very selfish, so of course they would complain about their own cars being destroyed destroyed instead of being grateful for the fact that they can live another day okay right which is what came across and i found a little confusing not having that context to view yeah. it through oh and it. it's it's definitely like very um super fi- very superficial when it comes to how people portray um, how people in this universe see big man japan they seem as like oh he was very stupid or all oh, the fight was very bad ah he looks very fat um it's kind of. It's also one of these themes that was also carried over into the anime One Punch Man, where in One oh, Punch Man, it's. I'm not sure if you've seen that anime. Yeah, but, I love Love One Punch Man. I oh, that's it, great. So, yeah. so you notice yeah, like a it. lot of the the Japanese public they view the superheroes yes. on a very super on a on a on a superficial level where it's like, oh, this guy he's handsome, this guy he's ugly, this guy he's cool, this guy he's not cool. They're not grateful really much so for the fact that oh, you saved my life, thank you very much. They're like, it's a popularity contest. And yes. kind of like the way how Japanese people, even Americans to an extent, view celebrities based on their outward appearances. Right, um, right, right. Although we do kind of in America, we kind of get in, we look into like way too much into the personal lives of these celebrities. I guess in Japan, it's all about presentation. Yeah, it's all in Japanese in Japan. Presentation is very big in Japan. Uh, so for Daisato to kind of fumble around and make a fool out of himself, that's obviously seen in a very negative light um, by his peers and by by his own countrymen. But I think I, I can definitely see now we're talking about the comparisons with One Punch Man, uh-huh. where, um, you know, it's not so much what the hero does, but how he appears and stuff. And One Punch Man itself is kind of like a, um, a parody of a lot of anime, and uh-huh. Big Man Japan is kind of like a parody uh, the kaiju genre. So that makes a lot more sense now. I can definitely see that congruency as, as we talked about there. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really funny because I never thought I'd, I'd make so many uh, connections to this to this um, movie from my own experiences. And of um, course, I could be very wrong with my with my uh, uh, interpretation of the movie and its themes. I could be very wrong. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, as a foreigner who has lived in Japan for a uh, little over a year now, um, you know, I can't help but make those comparisons looking at this movie. And it reminds me of when Matt Frank initially said on his blog, it's a very Japanese movie. Yes, as yeah. now as a Japanese citizen, I would say, uh, or uh, no, sorry, not a citizen, a Japanese resident, I can say, yes, it is a very Japanese, reflects a lot of this 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 culture. And even if you don't have the knowledge of this culture, it's still, like we mentioned before many times, it's still a very fascinating character study and a fascinating world to look at, even if you don't know the, the backgrounds, the cultural background of this movie. And even so, uh, even but with the cultural background, it gives you a much greater appreciation of the story and adds like more layers to this uh, kind of dark, surreal comedy. Yeah, and um, and for the people who haven't seen the movie, it does do a pretty good job of laying out a, a decent understanding of what the culture is like. I was just kind of looking to you for more um, introspective purposes. So if anybody's listening, to this, don't think that you need to have a whole lot of uh, background in Japanese culture to appreciate the film for what it presents in and of itself. What do you mm. think? Right, right. Uh, 
But I do say that um, there's a lot more to this movie than just the bizarre visuals. And because yeah. I feel like for most people, they see this movie, they see the weird kaiju in it, and they they immediately say, oh, this is just a weird movie that's weird for the sake of being weird. But there's actually like a lot of layers beneath this movie, and there's a really decent story here that I feel like most people probably won't give the time of day. And I'm only saying that because I've noticed that that's a trend among Godzilla fans, where they kind of yes. look, go to these movies, these type of movies, solely for the monster action alone, and kind of... And I- put everything else to the sidelines. Uh, see, if you just saw the trailer for this, you might be turned off by it because um, the monsters, um, they, they actually don't, they look pretty good in the way they're designed, but they're purposely designed to look goofy at the same time. Is that right? To, fur- right? to further emphasize the surrealness of this world. Yes. Um, where again, it's like goofy characters. No, it's like it's like it's a goofy world that's being played absolutely straight. So it's just like you mentioned before. It's a juxta. This movie relies a lot of a lot of its comedy relies on its juxtaposition. That's a word I couldn't get out. Yes, juxtaposition. With with the the absurdity of the character of the monsters and this world, and the more real world reaction to a uh, mundane real world reaction like a uh, workplace society sort of reaction that creates the comedy really yes. like um one instance was early on in the movie we see Daisato he's initially being interviewed the someone throws a a brick through his window <laughs> And he has zero reaction, <laughs> yeah. telling us that he is used to this shit. And then, yeah. like a good minute later, like right before the scene ends, another window is broken. <laughs> yeah. So that's where the comedy is, like you know, zero reaction as opposed to an over-the-top reaction, which is very refreshing for a Japanese comedy, in my opinion. Uh, so since we talked about the comedy, let's move into the, uh, I guess, the more a lot of the comedy would, um, because this, a lot of the story is very played out very straight. I think a lot of the comedy comes from like the monster action themselves. Oh, definitely, definitely. If not um, the if not the the nonchalant reaction to this world, if um that's like part of the comedy, but I think most of the comedy comes from the monsters fights themselves. And I like yes. how the monsters are shown to be just as incompetent or just as flawed as Big Man Japan himself. Right, right. You you don't have King Ghidorah attacking here. That's for sure. Yeah, you have these <laughs> yeah. the character. The monsters themselves also like awkwardly fumble about. Yes. Um, as much as Big Man Japan. Uh, In fact, uh, yeah. The the first monster that uh, that appears is uh, what do they call him? Like the uh, grip monster. He's, they, they don't uh, give them names so much as like titles. Like yeah. yeah, like the the jumping monster, the one eyed monster, the yes, the stink monster, the right. yeah. So the first monster, so, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you <laughs> describe this one. Uh, the first monster is kind of almost composed of like uh, workout bands or, or giant rubber bands. Yeah, um, where it uh, doesn't even have arms so much as just a, a large rubber band that comes out of its torso and connects to the other side of it um, that it uses to pull down buildings. But yeah, he um, performs suplexes. Yeah, like, yeah, like suplexes. That's yeah, exactly what he does. And um, it's also funny too. He has the appearance of like a, um, I guess, a middle-aged person who's balding. And yeah. the monster seems very aware of the fact that he has kind of like a comb over and it keeps falling off. So and he's also he's yeah flipping his head so that the comb over can comb stay over on his head. Stay on. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as for the monsters, each of the mon- the with the exception of the one-eyed monster. Um, all the other monsters have very human, like really silly human um, faces. And yes. my friend, uh, the friend of mine who was a fan of this comedian, Hitoshi Matsumoto, he said that these faces may have been ca- um, actors from the comedy variety show that Downtown uh, has. Okay. So that provides a lot of context that you most likely yes. will never hear in any other Westerns review of this movie. Because I think I'm from the few reviews that I've seen of Big Man Japan. They never really acknowledge the background of Hitoshi Matsumoto um, because this is clearly has the writer, director, and a, a leading star of this movie. This is clearly his movie and his project. Um, most but reviews, I don't think most reviews go into that that detail. So to have for my friend to tell me that all of these faces seem to resemble people from the downtown show. Uh, Add so much context, saying like, "Okay, this is a director who's getting his friends involved in this stupidity." Yeah, I, I had no idea about that. And you're right; I, I've read several reviews, um, American reviews, obviously, mm. on the film, which rated very high, but none of them gave any kind of context about the 
uh, director, writer, starring in it or his background at all. It was just like, this is a good movie for the story wise, basically. So that's right. interesting. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of like the, the first monster is that rubber band monster. And uh, mm-hmm. you see Sato go in and that's actually like the most kind of uh, fight we get for a while. Wouldn't you say? Because yeah, um, yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, the name of the TV show was that all these characters uh, that um, that uh, Hitoshi Matsumoto came from is most well known for is called Downtown No Gaki No Tsukai Ya Ara, uh, Arahende, which translates to Downtown's This Is No Task for Kids. <laughs> so that kind of describes like, yeah, these are people who are getting into either dangerous or stupid stunts in, in the show. Uh <laughs> So yeah, so it's like possible that all these characters, all these actors, or who who got their their likenesses involved may have kind of came from this show. Uh, but yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, what's really funny is that a lot of the fights end very anticlimactically, which fits yes. with the bumbling nature of Big Man Japan, where he kind of not so much he usually fin- uh, wins the a lot of these fights either out of sheer mostly due to sheer luck. Yes. Where, yeah, like, and uh, if, if if he doesn't win, things go horribly wrong for him, which is f- further piles on the depressing amounts of bad luck that's like it's either he's very lucky with these fights or very unlucky with these lu- with 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 the uh, with them. And they get kind of more ridiculous as they go. So yeah. the the rubber band monster is like kind of the first one, and uh, he doesn't have defeating him, and then um, all of the monsters. Uh, they kind of show like a like a light from heaven coming down on them. And right, see, like, that's the so weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That... So you, you see the monster's soul go up, but it looks like the body is still there. Right, it's not like the whole body no, no, it's sucked up by right, an right, alien or something. Right, right, right. It's like you see like the light from heaven shining upon the monsters and the souls going up. I think it's one of those. It's probably one of the few things where it's very traditional Japanese weird for the sake of being weird uh, okay. sort of elements. Because it's not like Japan is a very religious company, uh, culture, uh, very uh, overall. I mean, sure there was Shinto religion, and now Buddhism, Buddhism is like the most prevalent religion in Japan. Okay. But even still, for the most part, from what I've gathered from my students, uh, my adult students, it seems like Japan is rather agnostic overall, where they they really don't care too much either way for religion, and they okay. do the whole Buddhism thing solely out of tradition which again it's the whole thing of carrying on tradition for the sake of tradition okay so again it makes it weird just for being weird with the uh with the heaven yeah the, the heaven and, and the monsters of all things going to heaven <laughs> yeah which leads uh, to a really funny gag involving the grandfather at the very end in a form yes. a little a bit taste of dark more dark comedy with how they yes. handle that um <laughs> uh, and I love how, like, when it came to, like, the child monster, after the child monster dies, you don't see the body, but when you see the light, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to put things in context there, I think it's, like, the third monster he fights, maybe, is, um, mm. like you said, they don't really name him so much as describe him, and this monster mm. is called the child monster, and yeah. it literally just looks like a giant baby with horns. Yeah. on top of a building and they specifically mentioned that it's completely harmless so it yeah. can't do anything it's kind of wait still its mother finds it uh so uh daisato as big man japan uh, uh-huh. you know we see him kind of walk up to this baby monster and it's barely able to talk and you know communicate with him yeah so, um, and he's giving he, he's giving like an, an like a uh what do you call it uh what do you call it when you when you have a short story a soliloquy in in writing when or so. when you care when a character goes into like giving a short story within the bigger story yeah I mean, um, soliloquy yeah yeah so like the character is giving his this character is giving off his life story saying that he's going to die very soon and talking about yeah. his regrets in life and dice though he doesn't care he's just you know you see yeah. his eyes looking over he's like when is this going to end <laughs> and uh he ends up picking up the baby monster and then it, it starts to try to like breastfeed off of him and bites his nipple and he ends up dropping it. Yeah, which yeah. Is like a hilarious scene. And like you see, you don't really see the, the monster's hitting the ground. The light comes down. Yeah. And then there's 
um, like all these protests against him with people mm. holding up pictures of the baby monster, calling him a baby killer, you know, completely yeah. oblivious to the fact that it was a monster that he was called in to address. Yeah, you yeah. know, it wasn't like he went out of his way to go get it. <laughs> right, um, right. And again, it's all about appearances in this society. Yes. Yeah. And when you're seen killing a baby, that an innocent baby, then obviously that's not good for business. And, uh, uh, uh-huh. I was going to say, and some of the other monsters, they do use, like, um, not very subtle uh, gags about, like, them being related to sex organs and stuff. Oh, yeah, the, the one-eyed monster, which is a literal one-eyed monster. Yes. Uh, his one-eyed monster is a little literal one-eye. <laughs> uh, yes. That is probably, like, the, the creepiest one, uh, more so than any... I don't know, maybe the, the hopping monster is also kind of creepy because a, a head on a foot. Uh, but then again, the one-eyed monster is also perhaps the most disturbing and most, like, got the most reaction out of me. And how yeah. he's defeated is very strange because it kind of involves... Uh, I don't even know what he's doing with, with his stick uh, when he defeats that monster. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of a way to present this to your audience. So the the, the one-eyed monster, uh, like you said, it's it's one-eyed monster is its, is its attack... Uh, Ven- venue, I guess. He throws, <laughs> and, uh, he throws his penis at, at Daisanto. Okay. <laughs> he throws enough. a one-eyed penis at him. <laughs> and then retracts it. And then when it goes into something dark, it falls asleep. Which is even kind of uh. more funny. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Daisato has to... Uh, and he, he, has to, and he, has to he has to wash it whenever it gets dirty. Or yeah. gets, built in, gets like literal glass in its eye. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's all it's a lot of visual gags in 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 in, in this fight, perhaps more so than any other. Yes, uh, and then like maybe my favorite monster was probably the stink monster because it's the only one that talks, and so he's giving lip to Daisato and Daisato and this stink monster. They just have this big uh, a shouting argument to each other. It's like get out, no, go away, you yeah, go and- away. <laughs> And then the stink monster one's interesting too because they specifically mentioned that she's an older female mm-hmm. and uh, she won't leave and she's being, it turns out, hounded by a, a younger male. And again, in both cases, they uh, they really portray these, like, the male monster is like a penis monster and the female is like, yeah. a, is like a vagina monster, like yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. clearly. Uh-huh. And um, the, the female is like, and again, I wasn't sure if this was a, maybe another commentary on culture uh-huh. where the, the females, the, she's older. She wants nothing to do with this younger guy who's really like putting on a show to attract uh-huh. her. Uh-huh. And and then at the end, uh, you know, Sato's like, look, you can't do this in the middle of the city. And then the the young and then the sting, the female monster tricks the um, tricks the uh, Daisato into distracting into getting him distracted so that she can present him herself to yes. the to the uh to the male monster which comes off funny too then because the papers portray daisato as like monster pimp and stuff like yeah this, yeah you know? <laughs> again so, it's like this move this movie's narrative constantly kicks his ass over and yeah. over again to where he can never catch a break until the very end and then um, they do run into – so you have these kind of interesting fights slash interactions between um, Daisato as Big Man Japan and the mm. monsters. Um, dispersed with uh, – before we get too far, uh, we mentioned about his grandfather being the fourth. At one point, yeah. his grandfather gets out and um, makes himself big again. And right. because he's senile, like, you know, kind of does what uh, – things you, you might suspect uh, – somebody who is seen out older would do like, you know, yeah, some yeah. weird things like picking picks up cars. With, uh, yeah. Picking up cars, picks up toy planes, treating them like toys, picking right. fights with the Tokyo tower. Yeah. Well, I do like it in that moment. He does the Ultraman pose. Yeah. <laughs> Salutes the sun. And they got to take a picture of it there. Yeah. And then, um, because people, I guess, are so disinterested in uh, Daisato himself, the newspapers say, like, oh, Big mm-hmm. Man Japan does this, and he's trying to tell him, like, like, that wasn't me, that was the fourth. And clearly, like, usually yeah. they look very different. Yeah, but yeah. But people just associated as Big Man Japan mm-hmm. uh, doing this going forward. Also, so, I do want to say, like, the design of Big Man Japan is also very absurd, uh, where it's, it's, it's essentially a sumo, a tattooed sumo wrestler, yeah. but with, like, very disproportionate body parts, especially with the neck. He has a very thick neck, and he, all of that long hair is, like, just standing up straight. 
Like uh, Bride of Frankenstein-esque. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also kind of weird because after Daisato cuts his hair, he still has long hair. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess they couldn't really... Maybe it was like the CG budget. They couldn't afford to make a second model with of hair. I don't know. Um, as for the CGI, what do you think... How do you think it, it turned out? Because to me, I would say it's a grade above sci-fi original channel... Uh, sci-fi channel original movies. But nowhere... It's still nowhere near like what do you expect from Hollywood but I think it's adequate enough and cartoon- yeah. I think it's also cartoony enough to fit in this ludicrous world no I think you hit it you hit it right on the head it's definitely it's better than what you typically see here on sci-fi mm-hmm. it's not like Kong Skull Island by any stretch of the imagination no 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 um, you know it's not like that um but because of the way that it's shot and the way the story's presented it works out well there too where like I feel like if it was much better it would almost look out of place in the context of the story Mm-hmm. You know, if the CGI was a little bit more cleaned up, it's it's not terrible by any stretch. Yeah, um, you know, I'm trying um, to think of. I would say comparative. Yeah, it's difficult to think of it because it's in this middle ground, a kind of awkward middle ground, but it surprisingly works well enough for the story. And in fact, it's maybe like that's why maybe that's why they put human faces on because you're more distracted by that yeah. weird weird visual that you're too focused on the re- on the rest of this on the quality of the CGI itself. I would say maybe comparable to like uh, the current things Korean, the Korean film Dragon Wars, where like the CGI uh, is okay but yeah. not great, um, yeah. but because it's it's more it's shot in a more uh, not a serious manner, it comes mm-hmm. off better than say Dragon Wars does, where like they expect mm-hmm. it to be very serious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, also, kind of also reminds me of like the the CG quality for like Kung Pao Enter the Fist. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually very. Yeah, it would be kind of like that. There are yeah. CG elements there, but it's like yeah. it's so stupid that you don't even like be bother critiquing the level, the special, the level of the special yeah. effects involved. Um, outside of the green screen work for that, <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, when uh, among all the monsters, the one that's truly the most threatening is like this red demon oni monster. And even he, as threatening as it looks, it still looks quite absurd with its uh, disproportionate body parts. He has a giant baby head. He has tiny, tiny feet and hands for no reason. Yeah. Um, and he's the one that poses, like, the biggest threat to Daisato's life. And he actively avoids it. Uh, at first, we think of it out of cowardness, but uh, out of cowardliness. But it turns out that he does this because he still wants to be there for his ailing grandfather. Yes. And, and if then, he and, dies, there's no one else to protect him. And to put it again in context, I think he had just defeated, I think it might have been a one-eyed monster who decided to be there. Yeah. When yeah. the red monster first shows up and, like, beats him down. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Daisato runs away. And mm-hmm. like you said, they make comments that the ratings go up and they kind of keep asking when are you going to fight that red monster again? And, mm-hmm. and he kind of is dismissive of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the red monster, I was wondering and i've uh, i've read different reviews as that might be a um sort of a commentary on the red monster representing perhaps north korea or china hmm. to japan uh did you get that sense at all you and your friend as you watched it we didn't see get that much i mean i didn't pick up any sort of commentary there but if i think about it it could be that a lot of Jap- I would see like a lot of modern day Japanese is the, the like the newest generation of Japanese people are very weak willed, I would say, and are not they're so accustomed to everything being the same that when a challenge is presented in front of them, they have no way of adapting to a new challenge. Because in Japan, everything is kept the same. Um, you know, like everything is made to be as comfortable as it possibly can for this Japanese generation that when they're presented with a challenge, they have no idea how to confront it because it's in Japan, Japanese society, change is bad because it's different and scary. Okay. So okay. for Daisatsu to be presented with an actual challenging foe, he has no, he is in no way prepared for this new type of aggressive monster. And he's just quickly abandons abandons this task right away. Um, And it's possible that like for Japan, even though Japan is considered a first world country, um, the way education works in Japan, the way like um, everything work, uh, the way uh, people are educated, the way people work, um, it's like they're very, they're, they're, 
how, how what's the best way of saying this really um it's almost like they're very, they're caught they're very they're kind of like coddled like child like treated like children in Japan okay. so where um they are not very they lack the assertiveness to take charge of a situation and you know they just stay quiet and do whatever people tell them to do whatever the higher ups tell them to do um so I would say like they're very Again, not. I don't want to be very. Uh, I don't want to come off as offensive, but it's like they're very weak-willed. I would say. So when you mention China or North Korea or Korea or whatever, I would say like you know those come from a society where it's you know, like you have to be assertive, you have to make your own decisions, you have to stand up for yourself, you have to let your voice be heard. Whereas in Japan, it's like, you know, to do the, it's best to do the opposite of all of that and just blend into the crowd. Oh, okay. Um, the, the only reason that, uh, that I kind of got the, maybe it's one of those other countries is the way that the movie ends, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to jump to that yet or not. Um, Ooh, I do. I, I do see a lot of, uh, some symbolism there as well, where with, with Japan, Japan has a lot of pride and they refuse to cooperate with any other country, um, as a whole, because they think that their way of living is the best way possible, even though throughout this review, I've been talking about the flaws in Japanese society that are sl that slowly like killing itself. Um, so, it, you know, Japan would probably I feel like Japan would be a much more prosperous country if it allowed itself to cooperate with other countries. Um, but no, they're very, you know, ethnocentric where it's like our way is the best way. We don't need to change things. Things are great the way that they are, even though their their own government wishes to is aware of this country is problems and wishes to improve international relationships, more specifically with Australia. OK, because that's like the closest Western society country slash you know, continent that it, that's available to them. Uh that and I suppose with California as well, but mostly Australia. Um, so yeah, it's like this, but as a whole, you know, it's like as much as the government wants to improve international relationship and be less ethnocentric, um, the Japan as a whole refuses to do so out of that sort of pride. And so we kind of see that with Daisato's father, he refuses to see these other superheroes as allies and sees himself as like, you know, he has to be the very best. Um, and that ends up, you know, killing himself. And by the end of the movie, we see Daisato not doing that, but instead learning to cooperate by the end with these new heroes and accept their help. Right. Um, okay. So uh, maybe the Red Monster then uh, would be more uh, akin to the way that Shin Godzilla is dealt with, where like. Uh -huh. uh, she's saying we're like the the government kind of have no idea what to do when Shin Godzilla when Godzilla shows up, uh, but just it's from Daisato's point of view where he doesn't know how to handle this thing that's clearly a threat and more powerful than him. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's more like thing? an internal an internal threat as opposed to an external one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe like it's it's a demon meant to maybe represent a it's a literal demon to represent his inner demons and fears. Okay. Okay. Possibly, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, again, I see maybe that. we're maybe we're at the very end of the day. Maybe we're thinking too hard about a about a silly movie about a, a silly sumo wrestler fighting silly monsters. No, we are thinking about it. And uh, when we get to the end of the the movie and we describe mm -hmm. that for the people, it, it'll give them a lot more context to see like yep. why it's very confusing about exactly what that monster represents. And, Mm -hmm. what the whole movie kind of represents like right that. right cuz the movie for the very end takes a very like left turn and goes yeah. off the cliff for like the biggest like WTF moment in the movie where um the tone of the movie kind of change drastically changes the style the special effects all of it changes for the sake of an ultraman parody yeah, and uh, to to get us there so uh mm -hmm. we get to the red monster shows back up mm -hmm. and um Sato really doesn't even go out there. The government goes into his house when he's asleep and uh, forces him to turn into big man Japan yeah. uh, to deal with this issue. In fact, it, it's uh, depending on your perspective of it, they might even have turned him into big man Japan specifically to get him out of the way. I, and 
Mm. some cases I, uh, I feel like they knew that he was going to refuse to fight the red monster either way and yeah. given that the red monster was in his area they figured like might as well just force him into it and force him to, to in one of those like fight or flight situation shove him into those fight or flight situations and uh what's i and also maybe an interesting commentary about uh, the different um perspectives of mm-hmm. the older generation the newer generation in uh, japan is that during this last fight his grandfather and what seems to be uh, a movement where he's pretty lucid turns himself into big man Japan to try to help out the fight against this red monster. Like, yeah. Very bravely. So yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is, is that perhaps another, and I hate to keep putting him a spot here and make you seem like you're, uh, let's see. Spot, but, uh, I think maybe it's kind of like a, one of those things where it's like the older generation has to make up for the new generation, the younger, okay. weaker willed, weaker willed generation. And the older generation ends up like kind of suffering the burden, like a lot of like, kind of like a parent and a child where, um, in many cases in Japan, you have parent children, um, who become adults, but they're in, they don't know how to fit into society and as a result they kind of become very reclusive and the, the parent and the, the parents are forced to to um support their adult children much longer than they should have and as a result they you know it's they become a very a big burden on the parents themselves um it's kind of like this the stereotypical idea of like the the you know a uh, grown man living in his mother's basement sort of deal but except okay. it's a it's a legit problem in in Japan where to the point where they even come up with a term for these type of hermit people living with um being supported by their parents called a uh, hikiko hikikomori uh hikikomori are is a very big problem where people they um these adults they feel like because they've failed their society they refu- they become reclu- reclu- recluses uh, reclusive in their own houses and the government is actually right now trying to develop these programs to get these people back into society. Okay. That makes and, more sense. And yeah. just to put this in perspective for your listeners too, this isn't necessarily, um, it seems like we're commenting on a lot of the, the negative aspects perhaps of, of the Japanese culture, but that's just what I, the movie I feel like it, seems to focus on. Right, right. And it's also very important because a lot of people are very blinded to the flaws of Japanese society. Many people, yeah. especially people of like, you know, who we who the internet might consider as weeaboos, um, you know, they feel, they view Japan as this very as the perfect this perfect society where the best cartoons and monster movies come from. Right. Even though Japan, as much as we love their entertainment, their entertainment does not reflect 100 their okay. cult their culture it is merely a fantasy of what this what the of what the creators wish japan was probably more right, like. right right um there's a, a dark side to japan that most people don't know about and so like the more that people are aware of this the better i feel like it is for them to be aware of the current state of japan and even though, though this movie was made 10 years ago by this point it's still more prevalent because these problems keep getting worse as time goes on the, that makes a lot of sense and what you pointed out with uh i would assume myself for instance a lot of other mm-hmm. westerners probably our, our main exposure uh, mm-hmm. to japan does come from uh, like our love of monster movies and, and anime which mm-hmm. um because it's fictional it'd be almost like uh you know perhaps something in japan looking at star trek for instance just to pick something and say like oh i guess that's how western society is where yeah yeah wrong and you know and it's not necessarily the case whereas uh big man japan uh, seemingly is pointing out these flaws um but right, right. back to to the movie the uh the grandfather tries yeah. to assist him and is again woefully overmatched by this monster who mm-hmm. um just knocks him down and it's uh another really funny scene that you alluded to the grandfather seems to kind of be hanging kind of between life and death yeah. and as sato is running away from the monster he kicks the grandfather in the head by mistake and off mm-hmm. the rest of the way so you're right um, right just in kind of like a, a culmination of his incompetence like here's this person that cared for him growing up and he's mm-hmm. trying to fill the shoes and and his cowardice ends up killing the guy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And there's nobody to address his problems. So. Right. And uh, and by the end, uh, Daisato, he's getting his ass kicked by the red monster. And yes. um, out of nowhere, um, a family of Ultraman-inspired heroes... Well, before you even get oh, that far, sorry, it, it go does ahead. Yeah. show... Uh, because this is important, too. 
Yeah. Uh, the screen, your screen, as you're watching, it starts to flash, and uh, now to switch to the live feed. Yes. Um, and we know that they've. Been oh, and the, and there's things. a there's a message that flashes on screen yes. saying that we're switching to live. I, I'm not sure if this is meant to be like a broadcast on television, or is this meant a, a message for the for the uh, the audience watching the movie itself? Exactly. It's like a great metafiction piece there. And then it's mm -hmm. it's not just switched to this ultra family coming down. Like you literally switch the perspective of a TV set. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, a filming of a TV screen. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Like um, the Red Monster doesn't look CGI anymore. It looks much more like a man in a suit and like a very ridiculous, almost like a Teletubbies ish man on a suit. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and like Daisato, he's a man wearing a fat suit, but it's like a, like a paper mache fat suit. Yes. And uh, he's, instead of getting beat up, he's now inexplicably just sitting in the middle of the city as this um ultraman uh family comes down mm. and takes turns just beating up the monster and ripping his clothes off and stuff which is and, weird because uh, the cg model did not have any clothes i think no no that's weird and, uh, <laughs> this is uh where it came into i mentioned if the, the red demon was supposed to represent uh, north korea or china mm. um because i watched it the movie and then i looked in for some more insight mm -hmm. and uh some people commented that it's the uh the super justice i think is the name of the ultraman yeah, yeah. And, and, and right and right and he has his father. like ju father justice mother justice right. yeah something like that and his sister and they're all like pretty much decked out in red white and blue ah so, okay right. so and, maybe... and, then, and the commentary was like well the, the big man japan is just sitting back as waiting for this these red, white, and blue heroes to come down and beat uh, this bad guy. Yeah, because like Japan itself doesn't really have um, they have a self defense force, but right. there a lot of their military is mostly reliant on America's help. Right, and uh, there's even a scene where um, they go mm -hmm. to finish off the red monster, and uh, they all and this might be what you were talking about before with being reluctant to look for other countries for help. Mm -hmm. um, they all kind of put their hands together to do their laser blast. Yeah, and they encouraged Daisato to come over and at first she's like no I'm not I don't want to come over and help I'm, I'm okay where I'm at so, yeah. no come here come help us finish this guy so he comes over and he puts his hand on theirs and the laser shoots out and Daisato takes his hand off even mm -hmm. and he says um I'm not even really helping here it's just <laughs> I know that that's another really funny gag it's one of those things where now they're playing with the troll like at first, they're like playing with a lot of giant monster tropes, and now they're playing, you know, having the fun satirizing the tropes of you would see in a lot of Ultraman shows. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then it, uh, the movie ends with um, this super justice picking up uh, Daisato, again, kind of against his will, just flying off literally into the sunset with him right. back to their home planet or whatever right right and i love that like if the movie ended there i would have been very disappointed and that's how i like watching when i first when i initially saw this scene you know uh, i only saw them as clips but looking at the app the the uh, not after credits but the the credit scene because yeah. this is a scene that lasts throughout the duration of the credits and that adds so much more context to like the story in this universe because I love how even the Super Justice family is just as flawed and as ridiculous as yes. as Daisato himself. It's like you know everybody is flawed in their own way, and so it makes the characters feel more. The Super Justice family, as uh, little of time we saw them, it makes them more come off as more human, more you know flawed as characters and. Um, it addresses how badly staged the fight was at the very end because like there's so many moments where the music cuts out it's awkwardly quiet you hear like the a lot of the character even the ultra family are kind of fumbling about yes. they awkwardly try to rip off the rip the clothes off the 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 red monster trying to shame him uh uh like the mo the first thing is like the super justice he picks up a bus and just smacks the monster with the bus and that's when the music just like cuts out and um there's just a, a lot of awkward pauses even the the camera work like when you see an ultraman movie they try to like focus on or any tokusatsu production they always try to focus on low angles and close ups in order to convey the size of these monsters but they don't do any of that here it's no, just like they you know, it's like uh, they try to shoot it as if it was like a family sitcom. Um, yes. A lot of wide shots, a lot of overhead shots. So it just makes everything look awkward and cheap. And yeah. 
the uh, because the mother was berating everybody for for all the awkward all awkward moments in the fight. It adds so much more comedy and context to how bad uh, how how weird that last fight was. And what did you take of that as in terms of the larger context of the story? Like, I wasn't sure if Daisato like died, and this is kind of like as he's dying, he has this weird vision, and the red monster beat him to death, or if. We were supposed to take it that this happened and they just switched it to being goofy for the sake of being goofy. Because you said they do mention the other heroes at some point who I guess we can assume yeah. now was the super justice. Right, right. And, that's and that, the other people. Yeah, that's like the one hint that there were any of this that any of other characters involved um in this universe. And I suppose, kind of like in in Japan, you know, you would have the, even the, like in in Japanese media, the Ultraman series would take a break, and then eventually they come back with a new generation of Ultraman. Right. Uh, eventually, these, you know, there are times when like um, Kamen Rider or Ultraman, the Ultraman franchises, they would take a break for a while, then come back stronger than ever. Um, on of the, and on the other hand, you have stuff, stuff like Super Sentai, where there's always a new series coming out right. every single year, nonstop. Uh, but this could be one of those things where the Ultraman series in this the the Super Justice family took a break for a while and then they finally came back, uh, uh, with a new with a new uh, set with a new lineup of characters to protect Japan alongside uh, Big Man Japan, and the way I see it is like I felt I always took this as like literal because this this universe is so crazy that I felt like anything can go anything can go yeah. with this with this with this movie and uh I kind of saw it as Daisato having lost his home lost his cat lost his grandfather you know finally cutting ties from his old life he finally finds another fa- a superhero community that he can relate to who are just as flawed as him and that he can learn to cooperate with him. Cause I liked how the mother was berating the ultra, the, the, the justice mother or mother justice, whatever her name was. She was yeah. kind of pointing out the flaws yeah. of each character. And she even kindly pointed out the mistakes that Daisato made in is like, listen, I, I'm sorry, but there are certain rules to how these things work. Yeah. And yeah. you know, it's best not to question things and just kind of go with the flow with, with us. Um, it's just how things are. And the thing is, you know, Daisato, he's never really berated as much as like a lot of people give him shit all over, all over the movie. There's no there's nobody there to really give him any clear sort, sense of we mentioned this before. Nobody's there to yes. like, show him the ropes. And it looks like the, these characters will help him are actually going to help him like be a better hero or a more prof, a more efficient hero or a more presentable hero. Um, no, that, that actually to, makes a lot of sense. And then if you I'm sorry to catch up, but you think about the context okay. of. Presumably, these are the heroes that his father felt threatened by. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then the, perhaps the message here being that um, whereas the father felt the need to outshine these heroes who were clearly more powerful than him because Big Man Japan is basically just a giant, whereas these guys, like you said, are more Ultraman-esque where they can they fly lasers, and shoot lasers and, and, yeah, yeah. and everything. Uh, so it, it kind of works out as a good story-wise and a good message in that. Daisato is able to accept their help, even if mm-hmm. he's a little unsure of it at first. Which he yeah. you know, was clear when he's like, oh, I, don't, "I don't want to get up and help. I'm, I'm fine over here." Yeah, um, they try to then, like they said, try to make him more proactive as a character. Yes, and then if they accept him uh, and give him more of that guidance he needs, that's actually a, I like the ending a lot better than he dies and imagines the whole thing. So we'll go with that. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and um, it, it is still very random. The ending is still very, very random, but. With, I think the the ending credit scene is very essential to kind of wrapping up yes. this whole storyline. And uh, what do you think of it? Of that lo- last thing being used as a uh, end credits thing, as opposed to the ad- appearing as the real ending of the movie. I thought it worked out kind of well, just because of of the way that the movie does flow. It's a little again like not mm. what you're expecting. Yeah. Uh, so and and to put it in perspective again, there. The Super Justice family is like sitting down, kind of eating dinner, basically, I guess, and yeah. discussing the fight with this monster. And like you said, the, their mom and dad are kind of berating Super Justice for you should have done this better or that better. And uh, they're much 
easier towards Sato with as far as the suggestions. It's not like mm-hmm. hard criticism. Yeah. Uh, that they give to Super Justice. So. Yeah, and I love how Super Justice is like this whiny. He's like a very angsty teenage boy. Yeah. And he's trying to point the blame at everyone else, especially like the his sister who, uh, the subtitles they call her like Miss Don't Touch Me. Here's your paper newspaper. Like yeah. saying like she doesn't have, she doesn't really get physically involved in the fight whatsoever. She just rolls up some literal giant newspapers yes. to give to Super Justice and and her father just to smack the demon around. <laughs> so even he's berating the sister for not contributing that much. And I love how they also meant had this a big over the top attack where they pass the baby along the ultra baby along, yeah, and to use it as like a football attack to the monster. He's like, you know, maybe yes. we could have done that as our last attack considering how spectacular that was. It's kind of like the South Park uh, when they kicked uh, Kyle's brother like a football. Yeah, right? kicked the they, baby. They literally yeah. kicked him like a football. Yeah, at yeah. The, uh, at, the at, the red, at the red monster. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Is there anything else to cover now that we've finished uh, the, the uh, spoiled the entire ending? No, I think we spoiled it pretty well. Um, but it's, it's a 10-year-old movie, so I don't feel like it's you know, right. part of all of us uh, <laughs> to do in that respect. Right, um, right. I would so. just say, uh, if you haven't seen this movie yet and you're listening to this podcast, uh, I hope that we've uh, laid out good enough reasons for you to go and check the movie out. Because even with those spoilers, it's still a movie. I feel like you have to watch it to truly appreciate it. Absolutely, yeah. And um, even so, this might this review might also come as a nice companion piece to anyone who has reviewed who has already watched the movie and wanted to yes. get another uh, more in depth discussion or more in depth detail and perhaps pick on some pick ups on thing pick yeah. up on some things that they didn't get uh, catch on. Um, in their first viewing and maybe and, it might inspire them to check it out a second time. Yeah. And I was thinking just, uh, the, uh, the mm-hmm. my idea of, of the, my thought process of the super justice representing America, the football kick I thought was a, a, a nod as well. Oh and yeah. Had, like, that's, that, that's, that's another good one. Yeah. Like a pretty simple, the, the American football is pretty much only played in America, right? To any large right. extent across the country. So yeah. Um, Ooh, I did want again, to, uh, yeah, go ahead. I say it's definitely type of, especially the ending where you can uh, look at it and uh, and have different interpretations of what it's supposed to be representing. So, mm-hmm. so go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. I do want to say there's one shot where you see like a parody of the Science Patrol, and I know it was there because it's an Ultraman format ending. Yeah. But it's kind of funny how like you see this one shot of the ult of the Science Patrol. But they do nothing for outside of that one shot of them getting out yeah. of their cars and pointing. Yeah, they just jump out of the car. <laughs> and oh, you also see a jet. You see a jet flying by. Yes. So yeah. It's, 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 it's a good parody of like, so the Ultraman series and, and other similar so series. So. Right. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I did have one other thing, and that was um, if you were disappointed by how Colossus turned uh, Colossal turned out, and were hoping that Colossal were to be more of a giant monster comedy as opposed to a uh, drama, psychological drama character piece, maybe this is the movie you were hoping Colossal would be. Yes. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. So I, uh, it was kind of thinking, I think maybe we talked about it a little bit as we talked about Colossal too. I think it came up there with like doing Big Man Japan because of yeah, yeah. some of those similarities. Um, but yes, this would definitely have, if you didn't get the monster action and, and maybe silliness you're looking for in Colossal, you could find it here in Big Man Japan with, a, again, a surprisingly good s- story and character study similar to Colossal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I believe those have been our full thoughts on, on I was going to say Colossal, on Big Man Japan. <laughs> and so uh, any other final thoughts? Uh, well, I'd like to ask you this for a lot of movies. Uh, what mm. would you think? Think about uh, a sequel or a spinoff to Big Man Japan because we said no for Colossal, uh, which I agree with. Right. I was wondering your thoughts on this. I don't think it's necessary because yeah. the character, uh, like with Colossal, the character, uh, the character Daisato, from our interpretation, seems yeah. to have come full circle and has finished his character arc. And we've kind of explored a lot of this universe. But I did mention that I would be interested in seeing more of this universe. And perhaps seeing like uh, how, uh maybe a uh, super justice like a parody of Ultraman, and maybe we can get a like a nice little spin off of Super Justice and have just a straight up Ultraman parody, uh, and let's see seeing how that is like. 
Um, maybe we'll see him. Maybe he he doesn't like. Maybe he has to he be he has to force himself to get a human disguise, and he doesn't know how to fit into human society like his father or grandfather did right. many years ago. If we're There's... going by Ultraman traditions here, right, right. I was gonna say I I wouldn't want to see a direct sequel. The only thing I, I think, um, although the Ultraman idea is not bad, but the only thing I was thinking I might like to see would be more of a. A prequel and the story of the fourth, like shot in black and white, because they all the flashbacks to do are black yeah, and white. Yeah, yeah. So if, like that might have been kind of cool, and then to, to see the comparison of like uh, the way the fourth is treated more so, and the way uh, he handled things, who seemed much more competent at his job than Daisato did, mm-hmm. as like a comparison piece. But I don't know if that would be like a financially good idea. But the only kind of story I'd like to see is maybe a companion piece to this. I feel like. Right, maybe like a, a series of shorts would probably be like the best way because yeah. the way I've seen this movie, it looks like Big Man Japan. Um, it was the first movie that um, uh, Hitoshi Matsumoto worked on and he has since then made three more movies, uh, n- none of which I'm familiar with. Uh, Symbol in 2009, Saya, Saya Zamurai um, in 2011, and R100 in 2013. I don't know what any of those are. I don't even know if they're comedies or not, but it looked like Big Man Japan was like his own personal project. project. Okay. Um, something. This was a story he had in mind. This was his story, and he got to tell his story. You know, God bless his soul. And so, mm-hmm. uh, and I feel like it was. It really does feel like a personal one and done project for him. So I doubt. I uh, seriously doubt we'll ever see any sort of a companion piece or continuation to Big Man Japan. But uh, as it stands, it stands as a very nice, unique look into uh, Jap- both Japanese culture and uh, a nice twist, a very nice, interesting, dark, uh, comedic twist on the uh, super on Japanese superhero and uh, monster giant monster subgenre of Japanese media. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So, um, at the end of the day, I feel like those are have been our full um, spoilerific thoughts on Big Man Japan. If you haven't seen it yet, please do so. Or if you have already seen it, maybe you can check it out and you'll ch- see some things that we picked up on. Mm. Or if you have already seen uh, J- uh, Big Man Japan, what are your thoughts on the movie? And yeah. what are your possible interpretations, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. So at oh, the we end... gotta give our stars real quick. Which, oh uh, yes, right. Remind me, what do we use? The four or the five star? System? Uh, the fi- the five star system. Oh, the five star. Um, yeah. I feel like I'd give this a solid four stars out of five. Yep, yeah, same here. Movie. Yeah, it's yeah. a very solid movie. It's not. It's not like it's nothing that's gonna change the world. It's nothing that's gonna like. Um, uh, it's it's not the funniest movie I've ever seen. It's not. Right. It's not the. I would say the best parody for me is still Gahara, the dark and long haired monster. In okay. terms of, um, but this movie feel like it was used much like Colossal, even though it relied more on giant monsters, it was still focused on telling a very human story. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And paying, giving more attention towards Japanese culture as a whole, as opposed to the monster action itself. Whereas Gehara was just straight up, Jap- you know, Japanese monsters, and here are all the tropes, and here's all the, like right. the silly things related to it. And then there's Death Cap, where it's like, let's do that, but not smart. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not clever at all whatsoever. Or funny, in so, my opinion. Uh, but yeah, I think we can both say we'd highly recommend this for our, the kaiju fan base to check out. As an Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This out. is. Yeah, yeah. Like we've said, if you if, if you were disappointed by Colossal, this is probably more up your alley. Yes. All right. So those have been uh, now. Those have been our thoughts and yes, scores so, yeah. for Big Man Japan. Thank you yeah. very much, Matt. So at the end of the day, where can people find you? At um, MatthewDenyon.com, at uh, Facebook under Matt Denyon, and Matthew Denyon is where I put most of my um, work for my books and everything. And uh, all of my books are available on Amazon and SeveredPress.com. So please look for me there. Excellent, excellent. And uh, of course, you can check me out here on the Kaiju Noir channel where you can find more podcasts, reviews, podcasts style reviews um i recently put out a, a review for uh, our friend keith foster's comic kadoja terror mountain showdown uh, i feel like you'll get a real kick out of that you can also check out the last video that denny and i uh sorry um uh, matt's uh uh 
Matthew, Denny, and I checked out. Um, all right, sorry, the last pot video that he and I made, which was the sh latest episode of the Shoe Watch podcast, in which uh, he and uh, Chris and I all talked about um, their recent collaborations with each other and with other individuals within the kaiju fan base or kaiju artist um, community. And we also did review previous reviews for both Colossal and for Kong Skull Island. So yes. there's a lot of there's a lot of Matt Denian to go around. And if you haven't already checked out his books, um, please do so. I highly recommend it. And also, as always, I've I've, we, I've constantly been teasing. Check and be ready for the next episode of the Showwatch podcast, where I do a full on interview, so you get know all the ins and outs of this individual here. And big shout out to Frank Parr for doing the title card art um the ink the inks for this art and uh, i don't know if i i'm able to but i really want to feature his depictions of of uh of atomic rex and draco azul featured on the title card for this review i don't know in retrospective if, if we can able if we're able to do that but if we if you are currently watching his uh, frank parr's depiction of Draco Azul and Atomic Rex as like PNG figures on the Big Man Japan poster. Uh, big shout out to him if we're able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Even either way, big shout out to him for his contribu contributions to um, to the Kaiju Noir channel. So yeah, yeah. Special thanks to Frank Park, tremendous artist, very cool guy. Um, check out his uh, comic Arrakis. Yes, um, you can find it on Frank's. Um, Facebook page and everything. So and you can you know, be sure to be, you, can, you can be sure to pick it up at G Fest in uh, about a week from this recording. Yeah, Frank will be there with Wayne Smith, who does the writing for their stories. So, and mm -hmm. uh, we're working on a project together with the Rockets, uh, taking on Atomic Rex we talked about before. But um, just you know, ask Frank about it while you're there if you're there. Because yes. unfortunately, I can't make it. So right. not Matt Frank. I mean, not to be confused that this Frank with the other Frank. No, no. Let's be frank about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay I, 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 to, be, uh, to be quite frank i think we need to finish this episode yeah right here i think now. so yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah quite frankly we've gone too far in a few places <laughs> to put things frankly yeah so i have been andres perez aka kaiju noir and i've been matt denian thank you for hanging with us today and until next time everybody take care